This video is sponsored by Research Hub. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wouldn't it be great if someone made a video on all the longevity research highlights that came out in 2022? Well, hello, you've come to the right place. And to help with navigation, I have broken down this video into categories and the timestamps can be found in the description box. We'll begin with lifespan regulation studies, then discuss rejuvenation and regeneration, then my personal favorite, cellular senescence, then some technology papers, and then lifestyle, and then end with some aging mechanism papers. And as I don't have the time to fully go through all the papers here, I'll put the links to the individual videos, or you can continue the discussion over at Research Hub, but more on that later. So let's go. Now, is it getting hot in here, or is it just me? No, not me, just this hot paper on how body temperature, not metabolic rate, seems to be modulating lifespan in rodents. The experiment done in this paper involved placing mice above their thermoneutral zone to increase their body temperature and decrease metabolic rate. They also repeated this, but they had a fan blowing over the mice, and this wind prevented the increase in body temperature, but the metabolic rate still dropped. The animals housed at this higher temperature without wind lived shorter than animals housed at 21 degrees. However, when the animals exposed to this higher temperature were exposed to wind, the reduction in lifespan was no longer present. All in all, this paper suggested that body temperature is more important than metabolic rates for modulating lifespan in these mice. I think the study has many limitations, but it raises the importance of temperature in lifespan regulation. Moving on, this year we also had some updates from the Interventions Testing Programme. I discuss how the programme works in another video, but essentially it's a massive programme that tests different compounds in genetically diverse mice to see if it extends their lifespan. So the initial focus is on lifespan, not in the health biometrics. Anyway, most of the current trials are still underway, but a publication came out further investigating one compound, canagliflozan, which was previously shown in this interventions testing program to extend lifespan in male mice. Here they further show that canagliflozan significantly diminished the incidence of lesions representing five organs in male mice, as shown by the distribution of lesion scores. Strangely though, this compound also increased water intake, urination and bladder size in the male mice. And just a quick plug to say that I interviewed Professor Rich Miller, who coordinates much of the interventions testing program, so you can find more details there. Anyway, the compound that has most consistently performed well in these interventions testing program studies, as Rich says, the most famous of these, I think at this point, is rapamycin. In particular, because rapamycin, even when given late in life, extends lifespan in the mice. And so speaking of rapamycin, a study came out showing that early life exposure to rapamycin also increased lifespan. Here in mice daily from postnatal day 4 to 30, in both sexes by around 9%. However, there was no significant extension when rapamycin was given from day 30 to 60. But it's worth mentioning that the mice treated from day 4 to 30 had a severe reduction in body size to controls. Which maybe isn't surprising given that rapamycin inhibits mTOR which promotes cell growth. But importantly, this study implicates that early life treatment can have long-term consequences. And the study giving rapamycin to mice at the early stage of their life has also been seen in this other preprint from Vadim Gladyshev's lab, where they gave the mice rapamycin for the first 45 days. The median lifespan was extended by 10%, and the effects were greater in male mice. And also in this study, they observed the smaller body size. But rapamycin, canagliflozan, and body temperature manipulation could be considered during protective strategies. But another concept we've had much more understanding on this year are rejuvenative approaches, reversing the aging process. So one paper that led to a lot of news articles was this one, multi-omic rejuvenation of naturally aged tissues by a single cycle of transient reprogramming, <laughs> which is a fancy sounding title. So to summarise, in this paper they do partial reprogramming as opposed to the full reprogramming of differentiated cells into stem cells pioneered by Shinya Yamanaka, but ever expressing the Yamanaka factors. And so this partial reprogramming method that they termed maturation phase transient reprogramming is instead of exposing the cells to 50 days of Yamanaka gene expression, they instead got 13 days, and instead of the cells losing their identity in full reprogramming and becoming stem cells, they remain in this case as skin cells and are partially rejuvenated, or partially reprogrammed. And here this was demonstrated by these partially rejuvenated cells having increased collagen production and reducing the epigenetic age. 
And continuing with the theme of partial reprogramming, I covered this paper on in vivo partial reprogramming, where they evaluated longer term partial reprogramming in normal mice. And by partial reprogramming in this context, it means expressing these Yamanaka reprogramming factors for a short time period, with periods when they are not expressed. So the cells start to reprogram, but it does not completely refer to a stem cell and lose its identity, as we just saw in the other paper. And the way they did it here was to use a genetic construct in the mice expressing the Yamanaka factors, which they could control when it was switched on with a drug. And they switched on the expression for two days, and then the mice had five days without it. And then they did this iteratively for seven or ten months. The main changes they observed from the study was that there was a reduction in gene expression linked with senescence and inflammation. And my conclusion at the time was that this paper felt more like a mechanistic rather than a functional study. And whatever they were doing to the mice just seemed to be well tolerated, as there is no lifespan data presented in this publication. Anyway, next up is this paper that showed cellular reprogramming of human cells using chemicals. Now another quick plug, I will be doing a journal club on this paper on Zoom, I believe, as part of Research Hub and Fetal. Um, There should be some more details, hopefully I can share in the description by the time I finish making this video, but who knows, I'll keep you updated nonetheless. But to briefly summarise this paper, here they wanted to do the full reprogramming, not the partial reprogramming, and instead of using the Yamanaka factors, they used chemicals. And that's what they did. They converted human adult somatic cells into pluripotent cells. Very interesting stuff, and I highly recommend you joining in on this journal club that I'll do next week. All right, moving from cellular reprogramming to tissue regeneration. Just last week, I spoke about antler regeneration in reindeer in response to skin injury. The molecular and cellular response was compared with the back skin of the reindeer, and the authors identified some inflammatory signaling molecules more highly expressed in the back skin. By inhibiting one of these proteins, the CSFR1 receptor, it enhanced regeneration in a rodent wound model. So this study highlights the importance of examining other organisms that possess regenerative properties and what we can learn from them. And speaking of regeneration, a very cool study came out showing a wearable bioreactor that enables multi-drug delivery to facilitate long-term limb regeneration, here demonstrated in frogs. So adult frogs, a bit like us, have limited regenerative capacities. And here in this paper, they show limb regrowth and functional restoration of frogs after amputation of their hind limb after they were wearing this wearable bioreactor. And the bioreactor contained a cocktail of chemicals including 1,4-DPCA, BDNF, a neurotrophic factor, growth hormone, and retinoic acid. I interviewed Michael Levin about his research on this paper earlier this year. Then maybe next year I will make a more complete regeneration-themed video. And so with all this exciting news in rejuvenation, it's also worth mentioning that there are now many biotech companies focusing on rejuvenative approaches, such as those seen listed in this table here, and I discussed more about it in this previous video. Now, being your cellular senescence YouTuber, of course we needed to mention some of the senescence papers that came out this year. So firstly, shouting out to some review articles that some of my lab mates did. You are up, guys! <laughs> here are some other highlights. I have the coolest lab. Can old blood induce senescence? Well, it can, apparently, according to this paper. This suggests that there are factors in old blood that can have a systemic deleterious effect and supports the blood dilution neutral blood exchange we learned about last year from the Comboys, which builds upon the classic heterochronic parabiosis experiments, trying to understand if there was something rejuvenative about young blood or there was something deleterious about old blood. And it seems like this paper supports the latter theory. And... Unsurprisingly, this paper came out from the Comboy Lab, along with Judith Campisi, the senescence queen. The other interesting finding from this paper was that when the old mice were treated with senolytics before blood exchange, it attenuated the pro-aging effect. And they claim that senescence is neither simply a response to stress and damage that increases with age. Interesting indeed. We'll have to revisit it at some point. Now, I just mentioned senolytics without explaining what they are, and while well, senolytics are drugs that are defined as selectively killing senescent cells, um, the drugs that are being tested currently in different clinical trials most frequently are the combination of the satinib and quercetin. Now, a landmark paper came out showing that this combination improved the health and increased median survival of mice, and some human data suggested that this combination could alleviate physical dysfunction in IPF patients. Anyway, this paper from this year further looked at these data sets and found that by using these senolytics, it's increased the levels of this protein called alpha clotho. 
Now, alpha clotho is a receptor protein that is mainly produced by the liver and regulates phosphate levels in the body, but can also get cleaved and has roles in endocrine signaling. And a long, incomplete story short, when overexpressed in mice, it also increases lifespan. So if senolytics can increase alpha clotho, that may provide some explanation for the apparent anti-aging lifespan benefits. And then most recently, we've had this publication of a senescence atlas. I've only had time to briefly skim read this paper, but what they did was isolate senescent cells from mice, which is no trivial task. Um, And these mice had had muscle injury, and they did this in both young and old mice. So they were focusing on the skeletal muscle niche. And for my superficial summary, as I've not fully read it yet, it seems that senescent cells are blocking regeneration, even in young mice, and it might induce harmful changes in aged muscle. Frankly, I'm a little confused what to think, as senescence is meant to enhance regeneration in skin wounds. It's just all tissue-specific, context-dependent, probably, likely, who knows, I haven't read the paper, so sorry. But I definitely will read it at some point, as I'll probably need to include it in my thesis. Cool, so now we're going to move over to some technological advances that could facilitate future research in the ageing field. Firstly, there was this paper that expands, pun intended, upon a technique called expansion microscopy, which essentially, if you were imaging a sample, instead of zooming in using the microscope lens, you instead expand the sample and do so isotropically, facilitating super-resolution imaging. This work was pioneered by Ed Boyden at MIT, who I actually interviewed the other month and will hopefully get the interview out soon. But anyway, in this paper, they developed an iterative version of expansion microscopy to achieve expansion revealing and could see amyloid nanoclusters in brain tissue from a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this worked because the expansion, as they call it, causes molecular decrowding, giving access to antibodies, enabling them to see these periodic clusters in the amyloid beta plaques while without this expansion, they could only just detect the large plaque centres. And so the interesting thing is that this new technology will enable new questions to be asked about neurodegenerative diseases, but I'm sure it could also be applied to many other cases. Quite different, we also have a new CRISPR gene editing tool on the horizon called PASTE. Now, I will make a video on this in a new year, so what better time than now to hit that subscribe button? (laughs) Anyway, the researchers behind PASTE were trying to fill the gap, but without making gaps, to add large genomic sequences into the genome. Now, what I mean by this is that current CRISPR approaches either add smaller sequences, remove or change bases, and they depend on DNA damage signaling and repair processes. Whereas PASTE is here to solve this problem, and as handedly provided by the authors a one-sentence summary, PACE is a new technology combining CRISPR-mediated genome editing and site-specific integrators, enables efficient programmable gene integration at any targeted genomic locus without double-strand DNA breaks, leading to broad applications in basic science research, cell engineering, and gene therapy. So I think it's pretty clear I'm going to have to make a video on this at some point. So yes. Moving on, the whole genome sequence was also finally sequenced this year. Now I know what you're thinking, surely we did that back in 2001, with the Human Genome Project. Well, I mean, I was four, I don't really remember, but from my research, we did a decent amount, but we left the really challenging bits, like the bits of grease that you can't quite remove when you're washing it up. Until now, we now have the full sequence. And so that gives rise to potentially some more genome comparison studies. We'll see, we'll see what happens with this data, who knows? Because um, genetics is important, but then so is lifestyle. And this year I also highlighted a few studies in this category. Firstly, I made a video that investigated when during the day is the best time to eat. I looked in particular at these two studies. Late isocaloric eating increases hunger, decreases energy expenditure, and modifies metabolic pathways in adults with overweight and obesity. And timing of daily calorie loading affects appetite and hunger responses without changes in energy metabolism in healthy subjects with obesity. And these studies suggested benefits for eating earlier, but as I mentioned in the video at the time, being small-scale studies for short time periods with confounding factors, it's hard to conclude much, but I would like to see some more studies looking at the intersection of diet, food timing, and circadian rhythms. And alternatively to when we eat, there's also how much, 
And this year, we had some more information from the calorie retrial, a comprehensive assessment of long-term effects of reducing intake of energy, so calorie restriction. And in the study, they looked at how calorie restriction impacted the immune system of participants. Compared with controls, two years of an, on average, 14% calorie restriction, it significantly increased the thymic mass and volume and showed indicators that they were still producing T-cells. This suggested that the effects of calorie restriction are protective. Now, if you've made it this far through the video, you may need a brain boost. What an odd thing to say. Which brings us to the study that investigated how selenium, a chemical element that is essential for our bodies, mediates exercise-induced adult neurogenesis. Selenium can get incorporated into so-called selenoproteins, and this study suggests that release of selenoprotein P is important for neurogenesis enhancing effects of exercise. Part of the effect of neurogenesis in mice could be restored through just selenium supplementation. So that brings us to papers I've grouped into as aging related. And speaking of aging, are we any closer to a definition? Let's start with this paper, which I think will become a landmark paper, Somatic Mutation Rate Scales with Lifespan. Here they used fancy DNA sequencing techniques to examine mutations from different organisms at different ages and to calculate a mutation rate, which they could then compare across species, and found that there was a correlation between the maximum lifespan of the organism and the mutation rate. They did this by looking at intestinal tissue, but this is nonetheless interesting for a number of reasons, which I explained in this full video, but it suggests that improving DNA repair could be one way to counteract aging. And conveniently, DNA repair is what we will talk about next with this paper, where a rare human centenarian variant of SIR2 and 6 was identified that enhances genome stability. Now, it was actually last year I did a deep dive video on SIR2 and 6, and I highlighted how there was a correlation here between lifespan and SIR2 and 6 activity. And so SIR2 and 6 is an enzyme found in the nucleus of a cell where the DNA is, with two known catalytic activities, one as a deacetylase, where it removes acetyl groups, and one as a ribosylase, where it adds ADP ribose, which is just NAD without nicotinamide. Anyway, the centenarian variants possessed increased ribosylase activity and decreased deacetylase activity. So finding molecules that can activate SIR2 and 6, but specifically the ribosylation aspect, is no doubt of interest. And speaking of the nucleus, just last week this paper came out on how nucleophagy delays ageing. What is nucleophagy? Good question. It is the selective breakdown of nuclear components, so a selective type of autophagy. My brief summary here is that nucleophagy is important for restricting the nucleolar size, which has been previously linked with longevity, a topic I may dig into next year. And to end, let's end with the end of DNA, telomeres. Telomeres are protective repetitive elements at the ends of DNA. Every time a cell divides, the telomeres shorten, once they get too short, a cell can enter replicative senescence. Even cells that express the enzyme telomerase that extends the telomeres, such as T-cells, can't prevent senescence during proliferative expansion of T-cells. This paper showed that antigen presenting cells provide telomeric repeats to T-cells, rescuing the T-cells from senescence and promoting long-term immunological memory, so some altruistic cell-cell communication. And speaking of altruistic communication, come and join me over at Research Hub, also the sponsor for this video. Research Hub is a platform where researchers can upload articles, summarize and discuss the findings in reward for a research coin. The overall aim is to accelerate the pace of scientific research and to make it more accessible. I've already been using the site for over a year now and have uploaded the papers relevant to this video. So you find the link to Research Hub in the description. So with that, happy new year. Let me know what papers I've missed, probably quite a few. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.